And Matt Honan here in the front row, who wrote a recent cover story for Wired about these networks, is going to try and referee this social mobile brawl. Please welcome up Matt. <laughs> Keep it clean, guys. Hello. As, uh, as Brady was saying, these guys, uh, we've got some great. Uh, We've got some great panelists here today. Uh, a lot of us are carrying around uh, our social networks with us everywhere we go, in our pockets all the time, in our, with our little smartphones. And the uh, panel sitting here with me, uh, a lot of these guys want to bring it to you. They're sometimes uh, competitors, and sometimes their services are complementary. But we've got here, it's Jeff Holden, uh, CEO of Pelago, Pelago uh, makers of Whirl, Martin May, founder of Brightkite, Nahal Mehta, who's of Buzzed, and Dennis Crowley, Mike Tyson impersonator and uh, founder of Foursquare. Guys, uh, the location-based social networks have been getting really popular in the past year or so, but they didn't just come out of nowhere. And I was hoping maybe we might start off by talking about uh, where they came from, what the precursors were, and sort of what your backgrounds were with this. Dennis, I'd like to maybe start with you. Uh, were location-based services around before smartphones? Did smartphones create these, or was there something that was a, a for, oh, I'm sorry, location-based social networks, or was there something that was a forerunner to that? I think they were around long, whoa, around long before smartphones. I mean, we were doing dodgeball just with plain old SMS, and it's just a, you know, the need to make it easier to connect and find your friends. I mean, um, the, the original dodgeball stuff came out of just you know, knowing that there's always lots of dots moving around on a map, and then finding, you know, recognizing that as a problem and realizing, like, what's the easiest way to fix this? Let's just ask people in mass to tell us where they are, and we'll spit that information back out to other people. And maybe everyone here may not be familiar with Dodgeball. When did uh, Dodgeball launch? Oh, um, Dodgeball was an ongoing project of mine, some, I don't know, since like 2000 or so. And then we really, it wasn't until after uh, Friendster came out that it really started to take off, and we were able to, you know, it, Friendster kind of taught everyone about social networks, and we were just like, hey, now it's Friendster, but for cell phones. And so that really helped us kind of pitch the, the vision of what we were trying to do with Dodgeball to a lot of people. That was in 2004. But now did smartphones really change things when those came around? And well, so think, how? It just makes it a lot easier. You know, if you don't have to always ask the user to give up their, you know, specifically where are you, and the phones are smart enough to, you know, maybe give the user a list of places to choose from, or even like if they're smart enough to just to know where they are in your pocket. You know, as start things get as things start getting more location aware and can kind of talk passively to the network while they're in your pocket, like you can start to do more interesting things. Martin. Uh, I, before this panel, I, I was going back and looking at all of your applications, and I realized I started using BrightKite almost exactly a year ago. Um, and a lot's changed in the past year. Maybe you can tell us some of the things that have changed and how the market's changed in the past year, particularly in terms of uh, what, what types of devices you're seeing out there and how you've had to modify your service for those devices, or if you have. Sure. Um, yeah, so a lot has changed uh, over the last year. Um, it's. Uh, you know, it's primarily just the devices that have changed. Um, you know, there's a lot uh, more rich devices. Obviously, everybody uh, knows about the iPhone. You know, the iPhone was a game changer for, for pretty much everything we do. Uh, I think everybody here, uh, almost everybody has, you know, an iPhone app or is working on one. Um, uh, I think we're, we're going to start to see more devices like that. You know, where uh, we saw Android coming out with their phone. Um, you know, Palm is working on something pretty cool. You know, that's coming out soon. Uh, and, um, you know, BlackBerry is, is, is working on things like that, too. So, yeah, uh, th those are some of the things that have changed. But primarily what we've seen, uh, what, what has really um, evolved over the time, you know, that over this year is, is just our understanding uh, of, of what users actually want and also users understanding what we can actually provide as a location-based social network. Uh, so, you know, privacy. Um, Privacy has changed quite a bit. Uh, convenience versus privacy, and I think we might touch on that later on. You know how how, uh, how convenience is kind of like the opposite of the pri of the privacy that people want, which is control. Um, so yeah, those are some some of the big things we've seen. You touched on something interesting. You talked about the iPhone being a game changer. No, you're, you're completely platform independent. Is that correct? Buzzed is uh, can be used on any web uh, mobile web OS. Can yep. you tell me a little bit about? Uh, uh, about the, the challenges of developing for different platforms and why you, you 
might want to or not want to do that, and Jeff, maybe you could jump in as well since you have some, maybe have a different take on that. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, I guess I'm probably a glutton for punishment because I've been in the mobile space for almost a decade, and it's extremely, I think prior to the iPhone, it was extremely challenging to create any native applications for any handset uh, with any reach or distribution whatsoever. So when we started Buzz uh, about a year ago, we chose the mobile web as more of a ubiquitous platform where sort of different style sheets would be optimized for higher end phones that maybe had CSS, JavaScript, but lowest common denominator, any handset in the world that had a data connection with a mobile browser could uh, essentially experience Buzz. And since then, we've been na uh, building native apps on top of that. Uh, this week, re we released our BlackBerry application, which is in store as a top download currently. So certainly, taking advantage of you know, native handsets is important. But you know, let's remember reach in terms of critical mass of users. We don't want to turn everybody off, or anybody off, I guess, is our philosophy. Yeah, and we, we actually uh, you know, started the company in, in early 2006. And uh, <clears throat> you know, at that, it's amazing when you look at how the landscape was for mobile development, as Nihal was saying, um, at that time frame versus now. And we actually we changed our, we sort of dramatically kind of turned the corner with regard to the way we approach mobile development. We originally started we, with negotiating carrier deals and trying to build an app for a bajillion different devices. And this totally heavyweight thing that you've all heard the nightmare stories about, it's all true. Um, and uh, and you know, when the iPhone came along, um, it was a total, total game changer. Suddenly you had an ecosystem of people. You had a way of getting the, um, the apps to them. And so we've actually focused and doubled down on the iPhone platform. Um, we've also evolved our product quite a bit. And so World V2, um, we, we focused purely on the iPhone to, to get it out there and get, get a lot of learning and have a very rapid experimentation platform. Um, and with that, you know, after having some of that learning under our belt, go broader. And, and we're, we're big believers in the native app, but we also have an SMS interface and email interface and so forth to get that additional reach where the native app you know, can't reach. Um, you, you talked about how you changed the, your world, uh, now world 2.0. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what were some of the things that, that uh, went into your thinking about changing that? What happened over the past year that made you want to change directions a little bit? Yeah, it's actually, um, it was really uh, an amazing learning experience. So the, you know, the, uh, a mobile social network, I think you know, everyone would, uh, would agree, it depends on you know, viral spreading to really grow. And one of the things we found, um, we, made a, we made an early bet um, you know, that, that social discovery, um, uh, you know, sort of a right down the middle approach with social discovery of places and things and events, um, you know, in the way we were approaching that problem was the way to go. And the, our fundamental content unit was a review, a review of a something. And uh, what we found is actually people don't really want to write reviews. Um, it's, it was only a small percentage of people actually wanted to do that. And the way the system, the way world worked, the basis of it was that you had to have a, a lot of sharing going in your sort of in your micro network, going on in your micro network for it to really um, get to the point where you could look at the world through the eyes of your friends. So we switched to a completely different unit of content, um, which is the story. And so now World 2.0, the, you know, the way we describe it is it lets you capture the story of your life one moment at a time. And uh, that is actually, that's turning out to be a really good decision. Um, ultimately, our mission and vision for where the product goes is the same, but the approach we're taking is very different. Dennis, can you talk to me a little bit about launching a new social network right now? I mean, it was the, when you launched, did you have tools to import from other social networks? Foursquare, you guys just launched at South by Southwest, yeah, we is that correct? At South by Southwest, and um, you know, we were really hustling to get stuff done by then. So we're kind of still at about 30% of where we need to be with a lot of this stuff. But yeah, it's tough to launch another mobile social network because you know people look at it the same way. It's like, oh, it's another Friendster, it's another. Yeah, didn't, MySpace. don't people have social network fatigue a little bit at this yeah, point? Yeah, and I think yeah, mobile social network fatigue too. It's like, how is this one different? Like, I have to go through the process of adding my friends again. Like, Luckily, luckily, a lot of the tools, like um, you know, just being able to find people by Twitter name or Facebook Connect or you know, mine your Gmail contacts, it makes it much, much easier. And you can also, when you can do clever things on the phone, like just you know, scan through my address book and tell me who's already on the service. Like that type of stuff makes adoption a lot easier. How big is Facebook Connect for you guys? For us, it's uh, it's huge. I mean, I think you know, Buzz, I, I usually reference as more of a destination and not a platform. You know, there's hundreds of millions of users that have Facebook accounts, so you know. At some point, a buzz login and password might go away completely. Yeah. Just enter your Facebook login and password, bring in your friends, connect your Twitter. So it's extremely important for us. On our website, Facebook Connect is prominent. And I think there's a correlation between probably 99% of our users, the other 1% being like my mom, who's not on Facebook yet. So Martin's shaking his head. I want to hear why. Um, well, 
yeah, it's, it's, you know, a lot of people ask us that too, you know, like Facebook Connect, is that going to be, you know, like the share one social graph kind of thing? And, uh, you know, you don't need any other social graphs that are in uh, Facebook Connect. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I think I kind of disagree with that um, because I really have different social graphs on Facebook than I have on uh, MySpace and, and uh, uh, BrightKite and all these different sites. You know, it's, it's really different social graphs. Um, and uh, I think we're going to get to that. It's not just going to, I think that, you know, I guess a uh, utopic vision of, of like one social graph, it's, it's really not going to work for everybody. For most people, probably not. Go for it. I think Facebook and, and Twitter are kind of notoriously bad at groups. And I think a lot of the stuff that we do kind of is like, all right, because they're bad at groups, we're able to do what we do a little bit better. You know, so it's like these are the people that you really want to know where they are. These are the people that you want to meet up on a, on a regular basis, as opposed to everyone that you, know, you went to kindergarten with. I think this might be a good time to bring up privacy. I mean, privacy is something that people always ask about with, uh, with mobile social networks. They want to know, why do I want to share my location? Isn't that a little bit of creepy? Uh, can you guys talk a little bit about privacy and, and how you've tackled that individually in your different apps and how you try and respect that and what you think some of the best practices are around that? Generally speaking, um, my, my high-level view on privacy is that um, people will, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a problem that you only solve by creating value for people. You, you, you can't ask people to give, give up privacy kind of um, arbitrarily. You, you know, there's, there's got to be a real reason you're doing it. And if we haven't cracked the nut on the, on the value creation, people aren't going to do it. Um, I'm not personally, I, I don't think that privacy is going to be kind of the, the death of, of mobile location-based services. But I think there's still some surprises to come um, with regard to, you know, when people figure out kind of what, how they actually work um, they, they might they might still they might be a little surprised um, but you know our approach to privacy is you know we um, we went down the path of saying hey let's make this extremely transparent to users and uh, and, and give them tons of control um, and so you know there's, it, you, you always know exactly who you're you're um, sharing your content with and you make an explicit decision to share as opposed to a, a sort of a more of a tracking model and so that's that's it works very well for a storytelling kind of product it might not work in other kinds of products um, but you know that's the way we We've done is to make it just incredibly, you know, clear, and then give people a very, very clear value proposition for uh, parting with some privacy. Yeah, I'd just like to add, I think it's extremely important. We believe in opt-in, even double opt-in, you know, privacy. So even if the user might stumble into opening an app and all of a sudden it makes them aware, make sure they know uh, that they are broadcasting their location. Make it a few keystrokes before they can broadcast. Quadruple think, opt in. I'm sorry. Quadruple opt in. Quad quint, quintuple lob, right. uh, log, uh, opt in. But yeah, I think also in the beginning there was a lot of consumer backlash at other sort of LBS services. I won't name any names. Looped, but you know, <laughs> I, I think you know for consumers. There I had to go. do that. Uh, Dennis wanted to bring breakaway chairs to this <laughs> panel. I said let's just use the real ones. Um, but I mean, I think you know. We can't be stalking our, our obviously our users, and it's got to be a really big visible opt-in if anybody wants to broadcast their location or any content relevant to their location. I always think of it less as us stalking our users and more of users stalking each other. Yeah. You know, and so we've been we, we were doing this for a long time with with Dodgeball and, and with Foursquare now, and it's uh you know by uh, enabling people to broadcast the location to wide you know wide number of people, you're really just manufacturing awkward social interactions, and so a lot of the stuff that we try to do is like, okay, let's help people manage those and prevent against them. Like, how do you, you know, how do you maintain a relationship on this website with your ex-girlfriend without broadcasting your location to her all the time? You know, and uh, like these types of scenarios come up, you know, over and over again as you start playing with this stuff. And so, you know, I'm kind of, it's, it's always interesting to watch as, you know, we're talking about smartphones and how do this, how does, you know, how do these products get smarter as devices become more passively location aware? And if something's just always tracking you in your pocket, like that's, that's just going to come back and burn users over and over and over again. And so it's just going to be interesting. I mean, I'm, we're a huge fan of the opt-in too. Like that's, in my mind, that's the only way this stuff can work. You know, if it wants to buzz in your pocket and remind you to check in because something might be going on, that's one thing. But you know, doing the passive tracking just all the time is just a I recipe for a disaster. Opinion. What's that? I bet Martin has no, a different opinion. No, I kind of agree with that. But um, our, our stuff is all like check-in based. But um, yeah. it's uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think you were joking about quadruple uh, opt-in, but I think that actually uh, tells us something. You know that. Um, as I said earlier, you know, it's, it's convenience and privacy, right? If privacy, in a way, is about control, uh, about, like, choosing when you share your location with somebody and, and how often and, and, you know, who you share it with and all that stuff. Uh, but in order to do that, you kind of, like, need to interact with some kind of system and tell it, you know, I want to share with this person. It can't just figure it out for you. Um, and obviously, that's not terribly convenient. Um, so 
striking good balance between convenience and, uh, and, and privacy is, is, is pretty challenging. Do all of your apps export to other social networks? Can, you, can all of you export data to other social networks? And if so, does that create problems? We don't, we don't do it yet. We, we aspire to do it. It's just like, I can't send something to Twitter from Oh, app? no, you can send stuff to Twitter, but like a Foursquare check-in doesn't go to BrightCut yet. And so, I mean, that's one of the things that we want to do. All these things should be talking back and forth to one another. But yeah, like you want, I think you want the services to kind of be as, as slutty as possible, where they talk to Facebook and they talk to, you know, they'll talk to yeah. Twitter, they'll talk so to anyone they, they want to talk to. Yeah, so. you guys do a great job of that stuff. I mean, that's, that's part of the viral equation. That's the, the reason you can grow these networks as quickly as you, know, as you can is, and then, you know, we wish they were growing even quick, more quickly, but um, is you, can, you can have people publish content, very, very rich, relevant content out to Twitter and Facebook and other social ecosystems that exist now where people already, you know, they're already thriving. There's like people consuming that stuff and then drive people in and convert people into users who become themselves infectors. So the viral loop, uh, you know, you get a ra very rapid viral loop from that kind of approach, better than, for example, email. It's really, it's really interesting. Uh, like one of the things you can do on Brightcat, whenever you check in, um, you can have it go to Twitter. You know, as as pretty much everybody here does now, um, and uh, you can do that also when you post a photo, when you post a note, and it goes to Twitter. Um, but a lot of people enable, you know, just when they're checking in, they're checking at the grocery store or something. You know, some people actually use it that way, believe it or not. Um, you know, that goes to Twitter, and then there's a tweet that goes out, hey, I'm going to the grocery store, you know, and... Remind you know, me not to follow those people. Right, exactly. So, um, <laughs> so it, that starts annoying a lot of people, and it's, it, you know... So when we first introduced that, we didn't really think about it. And it's all, you know, you have to turn it on. It's not by default. And we actually... So we went, uh, we went ahead and we put a warning there and said, you know, okay, you know, you might be annoying your Twitter followers because they might not want to know about all this stuff, right? <laughs> um, and... Um, then we decided, okay, you know, maybe we should just take this out. You know, we took the feature out, and after, uh, you know, just a few hours, people started complaining really, really loudly about, you know, how that feature was gone, and uh, and uh, you know how they really liked it. And um, I, I am not really sure if it's that useful, but it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. You know, once you have a feature out there and you take it away, uh, some somebody always complains, and it's it's amazing. So. Um, it's kind of, I guess, you know, the people who, are, who have that setting turned on, just, just think about it. You know, think about maybe turning it off. Facebook's made an art form of taking features away and having a huge, you know, backlash. Yeah. Just yeah, about, we, okay, go ahead. You know, just wanted to battle Martin a little bit. We, we don't have grocery stores in Buzz. So, you know, I think it obviously depends what sort of feature sets and what sort of content and places, um, you know, that you want to integrate with. And our approach is a little different too. In that we have this unit, our, since our unit of sharing is a, is a story, you can actually put several micro updates together into one package and tweet that out one time. And so, you know, you can, you know, I have a story going here right now. Actually, several people in the audience have joined, um, which is pretty cool. Nice to meet you all. Um, and uh, and and so, you know, everybody in the story can post to that. But then each of us can tweet it out one time or a hundred times, as many times as we want, and post it as Facebook updates. And you can do that at the moment in the story that's relevant to you that you think is going to be really interesting, so that people come in at the right moment and. You don't, you don't tweet something out that's just empty or, you know, just, it's just all it is is a check-in, so it's not as boring. Can we, can we transition a little bit and talk about what's going to happen in the next year or so? Um, at lunch, we were talking about back-end processes. We were talking about uh, the iPhone and the iPhone 3.0 software uh, having push notifications rather than true background processing. Can you guys talk a little bit about that and, and tell me maybe what uh, the advantage is to being able to have, a, uh, to have something always running in the background on your phone? Martin, maybe you could start off with that. Sure. Uh, it's, it, you know, it comes back to what I was saying earlier about convenience. You know, if you have a background process, you know. Um, Maybe you can explain what that is exactly. Oh, yeah. Background, so background process on the phone right now on, on the iPhone, you can have one app that's open, you know, and, you know, it can do something. And uh, with background apps, you basically can have an app, you know, kind of like on your desktop where you just kind of like minimize it or close it uh, or, or just like hide it. And, um, but it's still running and is doing stuff. And I think in our context, uh, the interesting part would be, you know, to have it still maybe report your location in the background. Uh, the number one complaint about BrightKite probably that we have from users uh, that they would like to see work better is they forget to check in at places. And, uh, you know, I'm guilty of that too, and I, you know, I'll try to check in everywhere. Uh, but I forget, um, especially when it's like, I don't know, like two in the morning, you know, when I'm at a party or something, you know, you tend to forget. So, but, um, it, you know, when it comes back to the convenience thing, you know, convenience versus privacy, you know, I think, uh, uh, having automatic updates, uh, kind of like it's not just a technical problem; it's also kind of like a privacy problem. And uh, uh, you know, what kind of new privacy controls you, you build around that? We have we have some new stuff coming out soon that will hopefully address some of that. 
it's, it's cool when you think about like the auto nudge, which is okay. Like if there's background processes running, the phone detects that like okay, I, I've, I've left my apartment, I'm now somewhere else. Uh, it sniffs out the people I'm with. Okay, these are your friends, and it kind of vibrates in my pocket. Hey, do you want to check in here and let more people know? So more people show, some more people show up. Uh, it's like stuff like that is really exciting, you know. Yeah, we're really excited about sort of doing these passive relevant recommendations. So, yeah. you know, if you are a big fan of hip hop, for example, and we know that because you've clicked on a lot of hip hop events or you've checked in, you've buzzed a lot of sort of hip hop parties, then, you know, there's a hip hop event near you and we'll actually give you a little reminder. It'll be the front page of your experience on Buzz. You might get a text or your phone might vibrate as well. And so, Clearly, background processes play into that. Yeah. Actually, can I have one, one quick thing? To that? Yeah, and a, a totally different um, direction from kind of notifications and stuff like that is I believe that what you know the next year is going to bring is you're going to start seeing some of this. I talked about this yesterday in a, in a talk I did, but you start seeing some of this more organized data about place um, be turned into something really interesting. I know that um, the Bright Kite, you know, Martin and team are really excited about that. We're very excited about that. Um, we're finally getting enough data, I think, both of us to start doing and creating some really, really interesting discovery experiences for people, um, helping them, you know, sort of find cool new places, find new people and a whole bunch of other use cases and I think that's one of these kind of um, you know things people haven't even expected to come from LBS app so that's I'm excited about that I think like the, the idea of the check-in like that's still like a new concept to a lot of people like oh you check in and people know where you are but like that's kind of old hat for us we've been doing this stuff forever it's like very 2005 and now it's uh you know, like the name of the game for us is like, okay, what do you build on top of that? What are the interesting services? What are the things that buzz in my pocket that like remind me to go to karaoke next year when I'm here and remind me, you know, and start coordinating those social, those social interactions between the people that went last night, you know, a year from now, you know, mining my old data and making interesting stuff happen on top of it. Yeah, that's, you know, that's exactly it. I think location is just going to become another, another data point, you know, like, like your social graph and it's all about what you do with it afterwards if you do yeah. something interesting with it. Martin, I think that's uh Good note to wrap up on, and uh, thanks very much, guys. Uh, we're out of time, I believe, and thank you very much for uh, answering our questions about location-based social networks. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. We have Buzz T-shirts.